So uh, I'm lecturing games and arts at Abate University and we have a big line in digital games, which may seem a bit of a strange thing for an art history kind of like uh, conference, but I'll be kind of like talking about narrative arts and how games kind of like fit into those, even though they're non-linear. So non-linearity and narrative can often be kind of like thought of as quite different things. So the science fiction uh, writer Ursula Le Guin, she wrote this really good uh, introduction to writing um, called uh, Steering the Craft. And she makes the point that the use of the second person in um, uh, fiction is very, very rare. It's like you did something like that. It's like not a construction that's very, very common in narrative. And uh, she says, every so often somebody writes a story or a novel in the second person under the impression that it hasn't been done before. So she's kind of like very kind of, whereas in games, this idea of you do something, the player, is very common. And this kind of uh, negotiation of different tense, or different um, kind of persons is quite interesting to me in the, in the context of uh, narrative art. Um, because if you think about the first person uh, camera in cinema, it's often used as a kind of like monstrous or stalking kind of a figure. Whereas in games, the first person is a very common viewpoint. So these interesting negotiations, and a lot of people have said that games can't be art because of this sort of thing. Whereas I'm going to argue that we can think about non-linearity and narrative in the same sort of framework. So uh, I've done a lot of work on this kind of stuff. There's my book, Plug Plug. It's currently $9.99 on Polgrave. Um, they're having a huge sale. And I've also done some um, uh, judging for the Inter Independent Games Festival about narrative excellence in games. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Putting these things together, like narrative and non-linearity, maybe is a bit in my pedigree. I've also studied biology. Did you know tomatoes are actually quasi-carnivorous? So all those little hairs actually cause insects to get stuck in them and fall off into the soil. And then they kind of like, that's why you can only have tomatoes harvested once. So they're a weird in-between kind of a thing. And that's the kind of stuff that I, I like. And William Blake, for example, he's got this kind of like narrative uh, poem here, The Tiger, which is very famous, but if most people have encountered it as just text on a page, he would probably have been quite horrified by that because he actually made these illuminated designs and printed them out himself. Each printing of them was unique. So what seems to be a linear text, for him, you're actually supposed to experience by choosing the different, uh, the, the specific printing that he was interested in. And putting them together, we find in the midst of the um, kind of literary artistic canon, this non-linear sort of a text. So these are the kinds of things that I'm interested in thinking about and uh, talking about. And one of the most important things I think that games do is shape our experience of time. So they have this really powerful ability to uh, kind of change the way that we experience temporal uh, phenomena. You know, a diary, it's constructing, a, um, it's constructing a narrative, but it's not necessarily a linear one, or it's one that is not like a novel, it's not read from beginning to end, but it's accessed by the person according to their own sort of uh, rhythm. And one of the most influential people uh, who I've read on play has been this uh, Italian philosopher, Giorgio Agamben, and he's written this, uh, he wrote this really interesting chapter called In Playland where this is the famous Disney kind of like rendition of when Pinocchio goes to Playland. And as you can see here, there's no experience of structured time. Time seems to whirl past in Playland. And all of the children who go there really love it. It's an eternal weekend. There's no need to go back to the kind of like drudgery or structured time of everyday life. You can also see this in the Bacchanal, which is a kind of like ancient Roman festival. And gamers will often talk about this kind of experience where they wake up uh, or they kind of look up at the clock, it's 3 a.m. and they're horrified because they have to go to work in a couple of hours. They kind of this really powerful, uh, it's called the, the one more turn kind of experience. So play has this really strong effect on people's experience of time. Agamben kind of contrasts this with the experience of the sacred, which is very structured sort of temporal experience. You go to, uh, you know, a church or some sort of like sacred place and you are brought into the presence of the past. You're brought into the, uh, the living presence of the past in a way. We're currently heading towards Christmas. 
Christmas makes us remember both the nativity, but also all the other Christmases that we've had in the past. So he calls this experience synchrony, whereas the experience of play he calls diachrony. He also points out there's quite a dark side to play. As we know, Pinocchio, every time he tells a lie, every time he plays a little bit too much, his nose grows a little bit longer. And he barely escapes Playland. If you remember that scene in that Disney film where the children who have been in Playland for too long have a bit of a diabolical ending to them. I won't spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen the film, but it's quite interesting. And we've also been through the summer of scary toys uh, in the cinema where uh, these sorts of uh, characters that show the, the, the kind of like power of play to change our temporal experience has a dark side to it as well. And there's also the Toy Story where every child has this belief in this witching hour where the toys come alive. So this is kind of like a Gammon's attempt to map these two things, diachrony and synchrony. I mean, he's not a graphic designer, he's a philosopher, so it's kind of like uh, a uh, interesting sort of thing. The academia doesn't matter so much. What I'm more interested in is the ability of these terms to allow us to describe converging and diverging timelines. And this is the meat and potatoes of what games do to our experience of time. So we can describe some pretty uh, difficult structures through using these sorts of ideas. So this is a still from Mass Effect where you can see there's like two different names there and they describe two diachronic time frames that can't come together in the one playthrough of the game. And we can also describe some pretty complicated game structures. Games are really hard to talk about, so this gives us a simple language for doing that through using these terms. Again, it's more about converging and diverging timelines. Games use a shorthand, often, as you can see up there, the butterfly effect shows when timelines are diverging. So the butterfly effect is this idea that things can have more, of a, um, more consequences than we thought that they could. Or an interface element like a spiral, which shows uh, time frames converging. It's from a game called Life is Strange, which is all about time, so it's very useful for this sort of, a, sort of an argument. We can also talk about when narrative elements don't align very well. So this character here is the happy-go-lucky lucky Nathan, Nathan Drake character. And due, during the gameplay parts of this, of this game, he's busily kind of like doing action sequences where he murders hundreds of people. But in the actual kind of like plot and world building and characterization, he's a happy-go-lucky, really nice sort of a guy. So games need to be very careful in their kind of like construction of narrative, navigating these sorts of things. And sometimes the art of narrative design itself is to make what's actually quite synchronic, quite similar experiences for everyone feel like they've got a lot of diachrony there, that they've got a lot of possibilities, a lot of different ways to go. Because games are really expensive to develop. So if you can make people feel like there's more possibilities than there actually are, then you can save yourself quite a lot of money. And I think that we're heading into an era where a lot of these techniques that have been developed in digital games are going to become much more common to audiences that aren't strictly gamers. So this uh, text here, Black uh, Netflix's Bandersnatch, was actually developed by Charlie Brooker, or um, kind of the, the, the background of it was developed using a very common game uh, authoring software called Twine. So I think we're in this kind of era where these very specific gaming experiences are going to be through uh, gigantic plat platforms like Netflix become much more common for uh, people outside the game sphere. Thank you. <laughs>